Well, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning or good evening, depending on the time zone from which you're calling. I'm Christine Kelly, and I'm the new Associate Director of the Futures Career Hub here at Johns Hopkins University. It's a real pleasure to be with you all today. And please allow me to express my gratitude to you all for carving out time today to join us at Futures for a special conversation with JHU alum, Dr. Larry McGrath. And Larry, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us and to share insights from your career journey with members of the Hopkins doctoral student and postdoc community, alongside other friends of Futures who have joined us from across the United States and around the world. At today's session, Larry will share remarks organized around two broadly interrelated themes. First, he'll speak with attendees about, approaching, uh, about approaches to identifying particular career paths of interest. And later he'll then discuss ways that participants can build professional portfolios that effectively demonstrate alignment between one's career path of interest and one's qualifications for roles in relevant fields. I'll shortly turn the floor over to Larry, but before I do, please allow me an opportunity to briefly introduce him. Dr. Larry S. McGrath is a senior researcher at Facebook. After receiving his doctorate from Johns Hopkins Humanities Center in 2014, he went on to teach history and anthropology at Wesleyan University. Later, his career evolved to lead consulting projects for medical, technology, and life science companies. You can find Larry's writing in Eon, Medium, and the Journal of the History of Ideas. His first book, Making Spirit Matter, Neurology, Psychology, and Selfhood in Modern France, uh, and his next book will be about acknowledgement. Larry's varied and prolific career is a testament to the value of a doctoral degree, including a degree in the humanities, in both academic and non-academic settings alike. We're looking forward to learning more from him about how to strategically approach career exploration and portfolio development. And following Larry's presentation, we'll set aside about 20 minutes or so for Q&A, but please do feel free to enter questions you have into the chat area at any time during today's session. And so with that, I'm very happy to turn the floor over to Larry. Larry, thank you so much. Hey, thank you, Christine, for that really generous introduction and for everyone attending this talk today. It's really a pleasure to speak with Hopkins grad students, as well as others. As it was mentioned, I received my doctorate from the Humanities Center at Johns Hopkins back in 2014. That feels like a while ago, and my work focused on the history and anthropology of science. I love my time down in Baltimore. It still has a soft place in my heart. I should, I should preface um, this talk by saying that I, I might have to leave early in case I, I get a call from UC Berkeley's history department with an endowed chair in history as an offer because that would be an awesome job. And that was the job that I really wanted when I embarked on my doctoral studies. I'd take it any day. Qualitatively, that would be awesome. But I don't think that's calls going to happen today. It's very unlikely. And I think it's the realization of that unlikelihood that motivated a lot of you to attend uh, today. But the reality is that it's not just the tight academic market that is the scarcity of academic jobs that motivates a lot of people to leave and go into the business world. I work with PhD holders from the humanities and social sciences to help them find well compensated jobs outside of academia. And plenty of my clients are tenured professors. And they're trying to leave academia for a few reasons, principally wage stagnation and a lack of control over where they live. Business jobs really value PhDs and the skill sets we bring. And that's what I hope to talk to you about today. So the breakdown of this talk, I'm going to do three things. First, uh, discuss my personal journey. Second, talk to you about the value of translation 
And that's going to be the key theme of this talk, how to translate your doctoral experience, expertise, and skill sets into a language that's understood and that resonates with companies and hiring managers. And then after that, we'll open it up to um, question and answers. Just a, a little preface. People ask me, why do I do this? Why do I, why do I spend my time? I have a well-paying job. Why do, I, why do I talk to PhD holders? And the reasons are twofold. One, the business job market is incredibly opaque. And it's not made any easier by graduate advisors who oftentimes have no clue about what's out there. And all they can recommend to well-intending graduate students looking to depart is more degrees. That was the last thing I wanted after I finished my PhD. And I imagine that's the last thing other people wanted. So I hope to um, illuminate that opacity a little bit. The second motivation is political. I think that grad students and PhD holders are treated awfully by most universities. And my hope is that by getting PhD holders to realize their value outside of the academic market, they can not only be paid more, but we can also encourage migration of labor outside of the academic market in order to diminish the labor pool whose bloated size right now allows universities to justify meager wages for lectureships that ultimately lead nowhere. So I got my PhD back in 2014, and I took a really cushy, melon-funded postdoc at Wesleyan University. It was wonderful. I got to teach clever students. I got autonomy over my research profile, and I eventually had enough time to transform my dissertation into a book, um, which came out uh, with University of Chicago Press, and it's called Making Spirit Matter. But I had a lot of frustrations, especially as I look outward at my friends who were also clever humanities and social science uh, students back when we were undergrads, and they were doing things that I really wanted to do. They were going skiing, they were having nice meals, and I was stuck in Middletown, Connecticut, not making a lot of money, and I had to make a life decision. Is academic labor what I really want for the rest of my life at the sacrifice of all of those quantitatively nice things like a better income? Or do I really want to stay in academia? And so what I did in the summer of 2017 was buy coffee for about 50 people and do informational interviews. I began that process by talking with PhD holders from similar fields like my own history and learning about their transition outwards from academia. I identified some industries that interested me, namely um, consulting and research. And I talked to more people in those domains. And finally, when I was ready, I found a hiring manager at a boutique consulting firm called Design Science, sat down with him and said, I really want a job here's my resume, please consider me. And ultimately I got a job at Design Science where I worked for two years. And I was able to use my domain expertise, namely studying the cultural contexts of the human sciences, specifically um, neurology. And PhD holders have to make a decision reflecting on what they want to do in the business world. We all have content knowledge, but we also have formal knowledge. Those formal skill sets we have include our ability to pose problems, do interpretive research, collect multimedia forms of data, synthesize it critically, and advance findings. That's formal knowledge. Not everybody is lucky enough to be able to use their domain expertise, especially, for example, if you're a historian of Eastern Europe or a literature um, PhD holder of, I don't know, South African post-apartheid literature. We instead rely on our formal knowledge. So I worked at Design Science for a couple years, and my work was um, mainly spent in hospitals and clinics around the world, 
observing how medicine, specifically uh, neurological treatments, were practiced in diverse places for the sake of demonstrating cultural variants and going back to our clients, that is pharmaceutical and device makers, in order to give suggestions for how their products and their education should be tailored differently for separate markets. That's a key thing that people from the humanities and social sciences can do is appreciate cultural variance. How do things differ without necessarily being better or worse? That's the key mark of an anthropologist, in fact. I also found there were plenty of publishing opportunities in the business world, that it wasn't only academic journals with articles written by professors where scholarship happened. I was partnering with people in other businesses and presenting at conferences like EPIC, which I encourage everybody to look at, that is Ethnographic Praxis and Industry Conference. And it was there where Facebook found me and they made an offer that I couldn't refuse. And so I took that position a couple of years ago and now I lead a team of researchers who explore issues of trust, privacy and commerce, not only in North America, but in um, Europe and Asia as well. And what my day-to-day -day looks like, aside from administrative tasks and meetings, is conducting qualitative research with people around the world. And that qualitative research takes a couple forms. One is field work, that is going to where people live, where they work, sometimes even going shopping with them, and observing their day-to-day -day practices, understanding the tensions that pull them in multiple directions, and the decisions that they make when using technology. Another research method is hosting remote interviews, which have become all the more necessary in the remote work era of the pandemic. Doing focus groups. A fourth that I really like is doing diary studies where we have say 20 to 30 participants over the course of two weeks to a month, log in a diary their interactions with technology, with data, with privacy standards, whatever the research project might be. And I collect those qualitative data in the form of people's stories, their experiences, and I work with quantitative researchers who are conducting surveys, who are analyzing log data, that is what is clicked on Facebook's products such as WhatsApp, Instagram, um, and Messenger. And we get together and we produce reports. We make recommendations for what products should change. We um, advocate the narratives that should be told about the company. And that's what I do as a, as a qualitative researcher. And most of all, I get to work with a lot of other PhDs. I'm really in awe of the skill sets of a lot of my colleagues, many of whom are academic refugees. And despite our disciplinary differences, the common denominator is that a lot of us just want to live comfortably. I miss a lot of things about academia. I miss having clever students in a seminar room call me professor. I miss being able to shut my door and have a nice office and not have to care about the world outside of mine. I miss having June, July, and August off. That was pretty awesome. Um, but there are some things that I really don't miss. And most of all, I don't miss having to identify with my work. What the business world really allows me and can allow anyone is disidentification. When 6 p.m. comes along and I close my laptop, I no longer care about Facebook. Yet it's the case, as we know, for so many academics that when 6 p.m. comes along and you go to dinner, all you can think about in the back of your head is how to massage the next paragraph or what citation should have been moved from page three to page 250. It never ends. And moreover, you've got to be a rock star to make it as, a, uh, as an academic. You are your work. In the business world, I am not my work. I do work and I sell my labor in the form of my expertise and time. And it's a transactional um, relationship. And so I love that disidentification. That's my story. 
now I'm going to switch to talk about how um, humanities and social science PhD holders can use their expertise and skill sets to get better paying jobs in the business world. So let me share my screen. Where are PhDs valuable? When I work with clients looking to migrate away from academia, I usually suggest three places. The first is consulting, and that includes major management consultant consultancies like BCG, Cognizant, McKinsey, as well as boutique consultancies where I work, or like Gemic. Red is another one that recruits a lot of PhD holders. And in consulting, your external facing, that is, businesses come to the consultancy with problems, how to sell more products, how to revise a brand that resonates better with consumers. And as a consultant, you try and understand that problem, research it, identify and suggest solutions. It's also great for PhD holders to get a nice sampling of different industries. Most consulting projects will last from two to six months, after which you transition to another one. So it makes for a pretty seamless transition for a lot of PhD holders. The second area is research. Most big tech companies like Facebook and Apple, as I've listed, have huge research departments. There are also research companies like the Rand Corporation that spun out of the Defense Department. And you'd also be surprised just how many um, unassuming companies like Lowe's have massive R&D departments that invest heavily in PhD holders to understand what's the best floor plan or rebate structure uh, for their products. The third area is communications, and this one works very nicely for anybody who's good with words. Companies both have internal communication issues, for example, when presenting a new human resources policy, as well as external communication issues when uh, dealing with negative public scrutiny. I'm accustomed to a lot of that at Facebook. The fourth uh, is really anywhere. There are so many places that value people with PhDs, whether it's large financial companies like Vanguard or in Baltimore down the street like Mason. That company's chief investment officer, Bill Miller, he did his graduate work in philosophy at Johns Hopkins and it was only a few years ago that he offered a um, huge, um, huge contribution to the philosophy department. These, I think, are four typical places where people with PhDs land. Now, in order to make that transition, it's up to you to translate your skill set. And so now I'm going to talk about translation. I'll start by suggesting that we already do translation in our work. And that's not just in a comparative context across languages. We already do translation when presenting our work to different audiences. As you move from left to right on this slide, you move from the most intimate audience of yours, namely your dissertation committee, and area experts familiar with the local debates and jargon that you use in your research. And then move to the right, which are the broader communities to which you might present that work. We translate from the five people in our dissertation when going on the job market to speak to the broader discipline. And if you have a chance to interview for postdocs, as I did, I found that there were people well beyond history and anthropology. There were biologists and religious studies scholars on, my inter on the interview committees. And so I would present to broader canons and themes of liberal arts. At each stage, we're rendering our research profile more plastic, speaking to broader issues, and opening our research up to wider concentric circles, as it were. I'm going to close this door. It sounds like there's a fire. Translating our work for the business world is just one more step in that translative process. 
So what does it look like? I want to suggest that when translating your work and skill sets, focus first of all on your discipline. It amazes me how easy it is for myopia to take over. And we get so lost in the minutia of particular debates, the gaps in the literature that we try and occupy, the nuances of the literature reviews that we've conducted. And it's easy to forget about why you became a historian or a literary scholar or a philosopher in the first place. Start there. At the end of the day, businesses don't really care what the nuances of your dissertation were. They're very impressed that you wrote a three to 500 page document, which is probably gonna be the most complex challenge of your entire life, given that it probably took at least two to five years. They're more interested in what a historian, an anthropologist, a literary scholar can bring. We can appreciate contexts. We can understand the motivations of human behavior. That's what analyzing characters in a story is all about. A historian can diagnose change over time and where continuity meets rupture. And as I mentioned before, an anthropologist can analyze cultural variants. These are all the skills of your discipline and it's worth reflecting on those. Take that one step further then and think about the broader liberal arts community and how your humanities or social science discipline fits within it. For business, you can use that to identify problems, understanding consumers' needs, what they really want. is something that PhDs do very well. We can craft narratives and tell persuasive stories. You'd be impressed how few people are able to do that effectively. We can examine meaning and clarify the complex, taking a lot of literature and distilling it into nuggets that resonate is a key hallmark of our fields. And then understanding how communities are shaped, what ties people together, that's what a brand is. Ultimately then it's up to you to translate this into the most difficult thing I've found for academics to do, and that is show how these skill sets help a business make money. And by abstracting from the particularities of your research and translating it into a language better understood by businesses, what I'm suggesting that you're doing is shifting your mindset. The mindset of an academic is fo focused on the inherent value of your work. Indeed, I think that analyzing Emily Bronte's prose is inherently brought valuable for its own sake. I think that understanding Henry Bergson's philosophy time is inherently valuable. It belongs in the canon. But businesses care about what's instrumentally valuable. That is what affects their return on investment. And when it comes to the words you use, I've just offered a sampling here. Businesses don't care about your interests, they care about your skills. That is what you do, your activities. They care about your publications, but not the content. They care that you've published. They're more interested in your projects that you've done. Your influence is ultimately your impact. And crucially, it's rarely you yourself that's working in the business world. As academics, we can be rather monastic in our enterprises. It's not I who speaks in the business world, it's usually we, and we is always part of a team. Another place to start thinking about translating your skill sets is how you collect data. We all collect data. Data are at the foundation of the dissertations we write. It's just important to realize that data are not just numbers. Data don't only occupy spreadsheets. Data are also qualitative. And throughout the business world, there's, if not an understanding, then at least an acceptance that mixed methods are necessary in order to do research effectively. That is the thin data that fill spreadsheets need the thick data that humanities and social science doctorate holders can offer. So where do you get that qualitative data? Reflect on your own dissertation. We all do literature reviews, so we consult published work. 
I conducted plenty of work in archives, writing my history uh, dissertation, working through marginalia, letters, um, unpublished lecture notes. There you have multimedia looking at different kinds of data and synthesizing them together, which is a key skill that historians can bring. Interviews were something I did as well, working on the history of the brain sciences in France. I consulted a lot of neuroscientists to understand how they did um, their work on a day-to-day -day basis. We also collect data by going to conferences and seeing what are the um, ideas and projects of our colleagues. We do data by, we collect data by translating works in other languages or by doing field work and observation as an anthropologist would do. That is understanding not just the thoughts and attitudes of people in their published work, but also the behavior of humans in their day-to-day -day experiences. These are all data collection methods. So let me give you a couple examples. I'm gonna begin with my own dissertation here. What I'm trying to demonstrate through this slide is how I abstracted from the particularities of my research interests on the left and translated them into more general terms, framing my work not as a dissertation with specific research interests, but instead as a project that involved multiple stakeholders and that achieved key outcomes. <clears throat> So my dissertation was about the history of science in France and how the brain sciences in particular were invested in by the state in order to mold a certain ideal citizen in the uh, late 19th and early 20th century to serve the ends of French nationalism. I thought that was really cool. Businesses really don't care. What they do care about are the skill sets that were necessary in order to carry out that work. Interviewing, presenting um, my work in front of conferences, gathering multi forms of data, using our interpretive research skills, which we bring to the table, managing a project, indeed a dissertation, which lasts multiple years, involves several committee members, not all of whom might see eye to eye, is an exercise in project management. As we move from those skill sets, what I have on the right is verbatim language that I would use on my resume. I said nothing about the history of science in France or nationalism. What I do say is that I completed a 400 page dissertation over three years that consulted 12 stakeholders of diverse management levels. After all, an assistant associate and full professors have diverse levels within the hierarchy of academia. Your goal is just to present it in a language that resonates with a different community. The third down, um, think about your own teaching. Uh, most of you, if you were doing teaching, had to do it remotely. That's a huge uh, achievement. Perhaps you led surveys with 38 students via Zoom, uh, Zoom remote interface. And as I'm constantly telling um, the PhD holders with whom, with whom I work, use numbers. If you taught the course one year and more people taught, uh, uh, if, you, if, people, if you taught the course one year and more students took the course a second year, then you can demonstrate an improvement in retention over time. And you have a figure that is understood then um, by business people. I had a 24% year over year retention. And if you've applied to and secured grants, then mention just how much money you gained and what you did with that money over time. The second project that we all have and which we should translate are the courses we've taught. If you think about your courses 
not simply in terms of the knowledge that you're trying to transmit to students, but instead as projects that you have organized, collaborated on, and carried out over time, then you have industry experience that businesses value. After all, people are oftentimes asked as they transition from a PhD program to a business interview, but where's your industry experience? And I'd say, what? I just had six years of experience doing my PhD. That's more complex work than people at your firm will ever do. I wouldn't say that, but I definitely think it. And I think that's the absolute truth. It's just up to us to demonstrate um, how the projects we do are continuous with the work done by a business. So think about where you start designing the syllabus for your course. What are the requ requirements of the College of Arts and Sciences in which you're teaching? What is the department curriculum and how does your course fit in? These are all expectations that the course needs to conform to. In other words, there's standards that you need to meet just as much as any project in the business world needs to meet key performance metrics. You had to think about what are the learning outcomes? What are students gonna take from this? And how are they gonna comprehend the topics? That is what sorts of tasks, essays, um, exams, presentations, and so forth are you going to teach? And how are you going to iterate on the prior syllabi? As you break down your course um, further into a project and move from its creation to its execution over the course of a semester or perhaps even a year, think about what you're doing as a teacher. You're trying to build empathy, which is what any researcher interacting with the users of products is trying to do, empathize with how they um, navigate uh, what they're trying to achieve and understand their needs. You're collecting feedback from students you're measuring their outcomes according to benchmarks, and perhaps you're inviting other colleagues in your department or other departments to co-teach with you. That's a key instance of collaboration right there. And you also evaluate students' work. That's not something that people in the business world do easily, namely offering constructive uh, critical feedback. I think we as academics do it very well. As you move then into the accomplishments after the course took place, think about student evaluations. Everybody's evaluated in the business world. So too, you're evaluated in your, pro in your projects. What awards did you receive for your teaching? How did you help to change the curriculum? What influences in your department came about thanks to the course that you taught? How were students retained over time? Perhaps did you inspire any of them to take on the major? That's a key outcome that you can demonstrate. And then how did you iterate on your syllabi in order to um, produce new ones? What I'm suggesting uh, with your courses and as you reflect them is break them into the phases of your course over time. And you have there the lifetime of a project. You can understand how then you've managed that project and the multiple people involved. People oftentimes ask me, what should go into a portfolio. And there are a number of jobs that expect you to have a portfolio of prior work. Include your courses, those are projects. Take photos of the pieces of paper that you would write on in order to demonstrate how you framed the problem of teaching the course. Include some of the, uh, and take photos of the books that were included in your, in your course or students gathered around the seminar table and break it up into phases. And you have right there a project that can fit into a portfolio, a project that's likely to be just as, if not more complex and challenging than those done in the business world. So when it comes to um, actually going out there and getting jobs. I think there are four key elements. Your resume, your LinkedIn profile, your portfolio, and your network. When it comes to your resume, remember that the goal is not to be a truthful document. You shouldn't lie, but the goal is to be a persuasive document. 
So if you're applying for a project management position, say that you were a project manager as an instructor at Johns Hopkins. If you're applying for a research position, then you better make it clear that you are a researcher. The students in your classes, they're all clients whose needs you have to meet as well. You have plenty of client experience having worked in academia. These are all instances of translation in which you're making your research experience and skill sets as plastic across multiple domains as possible. The second element is your LinkedIn profile. And I think today, LinkedIn is the best tool we have for both job discovery, um, outreach with peers, and also job applications. And it's important not only to have a LinkedIn profile, but to have one that boosts dwell time. That is, it includes enough stuff on it, every video, every article you've read, so that when people see your LinkedIn profile, they want to linger there for a long time rather than just move along. When it comes to your portfolio, there's an example of mine on my website, which you're happy to look at, larrysmcgrath.com. It features three projects that I've done in the business world. And the goal is just to demonstrate my process of thinking and collaborating and executing over time. Finally, your network is really key. One of the biggest differences between applying for a job in the business world and the academic world is that in the academic world, you enter the institution as it were through the front door. In the business world, you enter the institution through the side door. And by that, what I mean is that it's key to find people in a corporation to champion you and shepherd your application materials into the organization. I, ref I reflect on the 400 or so applications that were about a ream thick and that I would submit to some anonymous portal for university jobs, crossing my fingers, hoping that I would receive an email uh, in the next two months. It just doesn't work that way. So start with your friends and family. And if you're at a university, go to career fairs and talk to people, talk to businesses more than anything, even if you aren't interested in the job, just to understand what is the language that they use so that you can take account of that rhetoric and parrot it back in order to sound competent in that field. 